Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, have Conrad Aguilar give a talk here in our seminar. Uh, he's from the University of Southern Denmark, as you can see, and he will talk about the podlish sphere as a spectral metric space. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. That's um, really nice. And uh, yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah, and this is joint work with Jens Kad, who's also at the uh, University of Southern Denmark. Uh, so let's get started with some motivation and um, intuition before we get to defining everything. So, um, so there's this area called non-commuter metric geometry, and it was developed by Riefel. And what he was trying to answer, he was trying to answer some questions from uh, high energy physics that were statements like fuzzy spheres converging to the sphere. And he thought the best way to do that was to, you know, show that these spaces converge in some sense. Okay. Um, so the idea was then to associate a metric. So there was already a way in classical, classical way to show spaces converge, right? So that was using compact metric spaces and gramoff hauser distance. So Riefel then made non commuter analogs of compact metric spaces called compact quantum metric spaces. And then he made his own distance called the quantum gramoff hauser distance to establish such statements as fuzzy spheres converge to the sphere. Uh, later distances came out like less from Rieder's uh, gramoff hauser propinquity, um, which is also a quantum gramoff hauser distance to establish such results. Anyway, in the context of this talk, uh, fuzzy spheres are matrix algebras and the sphere is continuous functions on the two sphere. Okay, and in another direction, uh, Polish uh, provided a, a deformation of the two sphere uh, using his quant quantum spheres, which are now called Polish spheres. Okay, so similarly, we can ask whether these spheres, these Polish spheres, converge to the two sphere as well. Okay, sort of mirroring um, what Riefel had done with these fuzzy spheres. Okay, however, as I mentioned, there's two things you have to, two obstacles, right? You have to first provide a quantum metric, a compact quantum metric then you can show, then you can try to establish convergence. Okay, so there's two things you have to do every time you try to tackle a problem in non commutative metric geometry. Um, so this talk will present quantum metrics on the polar spheres. Okay, so we won't get to convergence. Uh, it's actually something I'm currently working on um, here in Denmark, but we will at least in this talk establish quantum metrics of the polar sphere which will likely lead us to convergence um, of the polar spheres to the sphere. Okay, uh, but yeah, just to be clear, this talk is only about the quantum metric structure, the first obstacle uh, to be overcome. Okay, all right, so let's uh, define what the polar sphere is, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so we, you begin with quantum SU2 of Ronovich, SUQ2. Uh, it's a Caesar algebra given by these generators here and these relations. Okay, and in fact, if you have Q equals one, you get a copy, isomorphic copy of continuous functions on SU2. Um, similarly, um, you can do, well, then you can define the polar spheres, okay? And it's, you use, it's a special C star subalgebra of quantum SU2 given by these elements, capital A here and capital B here, and they satisfy these relations. And I'll, I'll be a little more explicit in this case and actually give you um, how, how, why it is, continuous function on the two sphere when Q equals one. So in fact, when Q equals one, you can recover the elements on the two sphere, the generators, um, by mapping the element capital A to this continuous function on the two sphere and capital B gets mapped to here. And you can check these satisfy the relations and that they do, it is isomorphic to continuous functions on the two sphere. So just to give a peek into that, it is in fact a deformation of, and, and, and again, to be clear back here, it's your parameter is between strictly between zero and it could be one, okay? But it has to be greater than zero. Okay, so we wanna then provide a quantum metric um, on the two sphere. Now, this comes from, again, so Riefel's, uh, the, the study is called non commutative metric geometry, okay? So the idea is that sometimes it's convenient as if you can get the quantum metric structure from non commutative geometry, okay? Um, and that's actually quite nice because then you have this, um, you know, combination of the geometry playing well with the metric geometry, right? Well, conveniently enough, there already is some nice non commutative geometry for the two sphere, uh, given by a spectral triple of uh, Dabrowski and Satars. Um, and you can actually recover that spectral triple in this fashion. Um, so you consider 
stick to spectral triple in the polar sphere. Um, you can consider the polynomial subalgebra of SUQ2, and also you consider this automorphism here and these spaces. Okay, and in fact, the fixed point is SQ2, is the polar sphere. Okay, and also you can define there exists a derivation on the polynomials of SQ2. And, but it, it's, its codomain is not SQ2. So this, you have to be very careful with this. Its codomain is, uh, um, is living inside SUQ2, quantum SU2. And notice here you see explicitly that these are not elements. Well, I mean, you can check that these elements, so you put in an element from the polar sphere, but you get elements that are not elements of the polar sphere. Anyway, uh, you can actually, on the polynomial subalgebra, you can actually just recover um, the Debrasky Tatar, well, the norms of the bounded commutators, uh, you can recover with this derivation here. Okay, it's just the max of the norms of plugging into this derivation. And why do we care about the norms? We'll get to later, but it, the idea is that you can form, sometimes from a spectral triple, you can form a quantum metric using the norms of the commutators um, with the Dirac operator. Um, so yeah, so that's a little introduction of the polar sphere and, and some non-commuted geometry related to it. And eventually we'll see how this can be, how this can give us a candidate to a quantum metric. And in this talk, we'll show, we'll prove that it's a quantum metric. Um, okay, but what is a quantum metric space? Okay, um, so the idea is that Reef will introduce a non-commutative analog to a metric space, right? So therefore you should begin with the commutative case, with the classical case, okay? Right, now, if you're given a compact Hauser space, um, and you're familiar with Caesar algebras, you know how to recover the house, the topology of the compact Hauser space and the Caesar algebraic structure, right? You can use the point masses, the Dirac point masses or the pure states, and you actually recover the Caesar algebra, the topological structure in the states, okay? However, what happens if you're given a compact metric space? You can still, of course, recover the topology in this way, but how do you also cover the metric structure? And if we can do this successfully, Maybe that'll give us a framework, and it will give us a framework to define a quantum metric space in this, or some sort of metric for a non-commutative Caesar algebra. Okay, so the key to this is actually the Lipschitz seminorm. Okay, and with that, you can form a metric on the states. So the idea is if I want to capture X in the state space, okay, I already know how to do that topologically using the pure states. Um, but if I want to capture it in a metric sense, I want an isometry. Well, to even do that, I need to talk about a metric on the states. Okay, well, due to Kantorovich, this does the job. Okay, this metric on the states, if you map X to its evaluation or Dirac point mass, and this is also a pure state, you get that this is an isometry onto its image. Um, and this was the map that, this, again, this, this is already established to have been a homeomorphism onto its image. That was just the topological case, but the idea, the whole point of this was to also see how to capture the metric structure. So this does the job now. I'm acknowledging, I'm not acknowledging this Monch Kantorovich metric. Furthermore, you still also want to capture the metric, the topo topological structure too. So two says that yes, we still also capture the topology, thankfully. Okay, so now we want to, um, now make a non-commutative analog to this. So this was, uh, Riefel used this as a starting point. And the idea then is to say, okay, uh, what are the properties I can use here that I don't really need C of X for, right? So this is why I give some other information here about L, for example, what if we just had some sort of special seminorm, okay, for which the elements for which is finite is dense. So we're allowing for, uh, just like, as long as X is an infinite compact metric space, you're guaranteed an element, uh, a function that has infinite Lipschitz constant. This is a nice exercise for your analysis students. Um, if X is infinite compact metric, you're guaranteed a function with infinite Lipschitz constant. So you have to allow for that, but you want the elements for which is finite to be dense, okay? And here again, this is something, another property you don't need uh, X to define, right? You have, it vanishes only on the constant functions, but you can rephrase it as scalar multiples of the identity, okay? If you just have a multiplicative identity. Right, and a third property that we'll want to capture is also a Leibniz rule. And again, you don't really need X to define this. This is just, you need a norm and a special semi-norm to do this, okay? All right, so um, Riefel then just did that. He captured the properties and he made sure that it was sort of, was able to recover some classical structure in the process. So 
a compact quantum metric space is then a Cesar algebra, unit still Cesar algebra, and a lower semi continuous semi norm allowed to take value infinity uh, is a compact quantum metric space if the domain, the elements for which it's finite, is dense. Okay. And it vanishes only on the scalar multiples of the identity. Okay. It's invariant, invariant under the um, adjoint. Uh, and also, you can then define a metric on the states. And in fact, all the properties above two. So before I list two, uh, is enough to guarantee this is a metric, meaning distance zero, if and only if two states agree. However, the properties above two aren't enough to with metrize the weak star topology. So this is where you add the condition that you're requiring metrization of the weak star topology. Okay, so you might think, okay, great, we just copy and paste this stuff from the previous slide. Um, why is this a compact quantum metric? Why is this the right notion of a non commuter metric space? Well, the idea is that you can actually, with this structure, this is enough structure to actually rec recover this abstract L as a Lipschitz seminorm associated to the von Schneekorovich metric. So you can actually capture the, this abstract structure using, uh, as a Lipschitz seminorm with respect to this metric. The idea is that you can embed A into continuous functions on the state space, uh, or in particular the self adjoint elements, and that's a linear isometry. Um, and not only is that nice that you can recover L, again, it's via a linear isometry, it's not a multiplicative map, but you can recover L as a Lipschitz seminorm. That's not only nice, but it also gives you some nice equivalences for this hard to check condition of metrization of the weak star topology. That's usually a very hard condition to check, okay? Uh, in particular, we have this equivalent statement that we've approved. Um, you, could, you can, instead of proving metrization of weak star topology, you can just prove there exists a state such that this element, this set is totally bounded. And this is nice because this is now you're at the level of the Caesar algebra. Calculations are much nicer there. Um, so yes, not only is it you're able to, this is enough structure to capture some classical picture, but also it gives you some nice tools as well. Okay. And we call L a lip norm and we say it's Leibniz if it satisfies that property. So this is also something nice to have um, in the definition of a compact quantum metric space. Okay, so hopefully I convinced you this is what we want to do. Um, um, but for a second, for a moment, we'll just mention some examples. Um, and then we'll see how we can do this for the uh, polar sphere. Okay, some classic example with some uh, words. One refo proved that non commuter tori or quantum tori are compact quantum metric spaces. A Tremier curve non commuter tori, some groups, these algebras due to refo and Ozawa and refo, AF algebra work of Anthony Sue Christensen, La Tremier, and myself, and non commuter solenoids, and many, many more. And of course, we'll show how we add to the list today the, uh, uh, the Podlis spheres. Okay. So, <clears throat> Um, why are spectral triples nice? So I was mentioning that sometimes, right, if, if you're trying to make some, a study of non commutative metric geometry, you'd like it to some, you know, behave well with, with non commutative geometry. You'd like it to be some sort of um, connection between them. Um, and in fact, Riefel um, used also this structure of spectral triples as a starting point um, using work of Kahn. So Kahn did have a metric on the state space uh, using this particular structure as well. Um, but he didn't require, he didn't have an abstract definition that allowed for more structure besides spectral triples. So Riefel used the work of Kahn to sort of make this, uh, to formalize the definition of a quantum metric space. Um, and then Belisard, Marcoli, and Rayani um, called this a compact spectral metric space. So the idea is you take a spectral triple. So when you have a spectral triple and you induce a seminorm on it, and it ends up giving you a compact quantum metric space. We call this a compact spectral metric space. And the seminorm you want to do that with is one we showed earlier in a couple slides earlier that you just want to take the norms of the bounded commutators. Okay. Um, this is a natural thing to choose in general, but we see here that it gives us many of the properties that we want to tackle for being a quantum metric. Okay. In particular, automatically the, the, the domain is dense. Automatically, the map is the seminorms uh, lower semi-continuous. Automatically, the kernel contains the scalars. It's invariant under the star, and it's also Leibniz. Okay, so not only is it nice to 
use uh, non-commutative geometry for the purposes of non-commutative yes. geometry and vice versa. Yes, Not only that nice, but also we already have, it's, 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 an, it's already a good candidate, okay? But of course, there are things you need to check. For example, I didn't list here metrization of the weak star topology, right? The really difficult thing that needs to be checked. But I mean, there are also things like this. The kernel better be just the scalars, um, right? This, this contains the scalars, but remember, we need to add, we really need to have equality for the kernel to be equal to the scalars. The idea is we have metric on states. States are only guaranteed to vanish on scalars. So, you know, there's, it's really important to just have equality on the scalars. Um, so this is also important to check too, but in particular, what's not guaranteed is metrization of weak star topology, um, even though you have all these nice properties. Uh, so spectral triple is just a nice starting point and motivated by the work of Kong that became, that came before Riefel. Um, okay, so let's recall this structure, the spectral triple structure, uh, structure that we had for the polar sphere. So we had a derivation, satisfies those properties. We can recover the these values, um, the norms, the semi-norm values um, on the polynomial subalgebra using the max of um, evaluation under the derivation. And the main thing we'll discuss today is, uh, we'll answer is, uh, is this a compact spectral metric space? Okay. Uh, meaning, does that induce, does that give you a quantum metric space? Okay. Um, in particular, does the associated modulator of a metric uh, metrize the weak star topology on the state space? Okay, so how do we, how do we even approach this? Um, so the idea is that um, we remember some further structure of the polar sphere. In particular, for all Q strictly less than one, uh, this is, a, the polar sphere is isomorphic to the unitization of the compact operators, okay? Now, furthermore, we already mentioned that C of X already has nice quantum metric structure, okay? Now there's a very nice C of X living inside the compact operators, okay? In particular, the, the diagonal, right? The diagonal is a commutative, unital commutative C star subalgebra of the unitization of the compact operators. So our point of approach was, let's see if we can get the diagonal as a compact spectral metric space first, okay? And then from there, maybe extract the information from there to get that all the compact operators in this case um, represented as the polar sphere is um, a quantum metric space, okay? So that's our strategy. And that part's not in the paper. Um, <laughs> the, paper had, the paper answered the main question, but so, but when I, you know, so given giving a talk on this, I want to present sort of like uh, how we actually built up to that. Um, and it was to tackle the diagonal first and then um, build intuition from there and move forward. Um, okay. And another convenient thing is that uh, the diagonal is a nice, it's not only nice because it's a diagonal, but it's also given by the Easter algebra generated by this element A, capital A. So it's that, that continuous functions on the spectrum of A which is this quantized interval, zero, and then a sequence converging to zero as well. Um, so our first uh, attack is to show that this is a Leibniz compact quantum metric space, and it's already a C of X, right? Okay, so let's see how we can at least do this and then build from there. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is that well, we already know that C of the spectrum, continuous function on the spectrum, is a compact quantum metric space with just the usual Lipschitz seminorm. Okay. However, we'll mention later. Uh, unfortunately, the Lipschitz seminorm is not the one, the, le the seminorm given by the spectral triple of the Brassi Sataris. But maybe we can get some intuition on the proof of the fact that C of X with the Lipschitz seminorm, uh, LDR is a quantum metric space, we can get some motivation from there and then sort of translate that to the intuition of that proof into the uh, spectral triple setting and then further to all the compact operators. Okay, so here's a little uh, peak of the proof of showing C of X. So this, this, this works for any C of X, not just C of zero one or whatever. And we're focusing on C of zero one, we'll see in a moment why, uh, not just continuous functions on the spectrum, but You'll see in the next slide why I'm focusing on the full interval uh, for motivation. 
Anyway, to show that C of zero one or C of X is a compact quantum metric space, you take a state, I guess it should go there to remind you. We're trying to show this set is totally bounded, okay? Well, how do you do that? Well, you just look at, you, you combine these two different pieces of information together, okay? So if you take a function that vanishes at zero, then you actually get that the norm is less than or equal to the Lipschitz seminorm, okay? So that's all we needed left because our zeta, well, this set is already equicontinuous by just this condition. So all we need left is the boundedness condition. And it's also already closed. Remember, LDR is uh, lower semi-continuous. Well, I guess that'll give us compactness. But So this is enough. So vanishing under that state is enough to actually give us um, that the norm is bounded. Norm is bounded by one when it's in this set because we're able to compare the norm with the semi-norm, okay? So that's the key is, can we compare the norm somehow with the semi-norm? Okay, that's a, if you can do that, then you're very happy because then of course that's bounded by one, that's bounded and equicontinuous, Arzea, that's um, uh, We're happy under the, right under the correct conditions, okay? However, this proof is very much based on X, right? Okay, so here, here's a proof if you've never seen. So of course, when you have just C of X, just take delta sub x for some point. I mean, you can just, re re this is the proof that C of x is a compact quantum metric space. Um, uh, so that's nice to see, but the issue is very much based on x. And eventually, you know, yes, we're looking at the diagonal, but we really want to think about them as operators. We want to see their algebraic approach, an operator approach, not just, you know, functions on x, okay? So it turns out you can translate this strategy we have here sort of, you know, in terms of operators, if you're careful. And this is why I'm looking at C of zero one. Okay, in particular, um, the seminorm LDQ, the, the one from the spectral triple, is given by a derivation. Well, so is the seminorm LDR, as long as you're on the whole interval. That's given by a derivation as well. Okay, and in fact, for functions with a continuous derivative, um, you have that the Lipschitz seminorm is the norm of the derivative. So this is already getting more. Um, Operator algebraic, right? You have a norm of the of a derivation of an element, right? And the norm, I mean, yes, it's, it's the supremum over x, but it's still this is getting more operator feeling, right? Operator algebraic. Okay, but let's see how we can, you know, reproduce the last proof on the previous slide using just operator structures. So the idea is, remember, we wanted to get the norm of just f, right, in comparison with the Lipschitz norm. So how do you do that? Well, here I would like to just get rid of the prime, the derivative. Okay, well, we have a way of doing that from calculus, right? We have integration, okay? So this is just reproducing the proof on the previous slide, now using the Volterra operator, right? Just a fancy word for the integration op as an operator. Um, and we get that f v of f prime is just function minus uh, evaluation at zero, right? That's just because we're integrating starting at zero, nothing more complicated than that. And you get the norm, Okay, if you vanish at zero, this goes away. You get the norm of f is less than or equal to, again, the Lipschitz constant if you vanish it. So we were able to reproduce the previous proof in an operator way, right? Not, not a you know, C of x way, not a commutator way, right? We were just dealing with f, derivations, an operator that cancels the derivative, right? It's sort of an inverse of the derivative. Um, so this is hope. So the idea then is can we do that for this other derivation, right? The derivation. Uh, that gives us um, the semi-norm from the de Brasi sitar spectral triple, right? If we can cancel that, then maybe, right, um, we can use the same proof there. Of course, there are different, right, we're not the same semi-norm as the Lipschitz semi-norm, so things aren't going to work out that well, but this has the strategy, okay? All right. So the idea then is to understand these elements a little further, okay? In fact, what is the derivation? And the key is actually just understanding the derivation on the uh, characteristic functions, right? There's many, there's many characteristic functions because we are, aside from zero, we're discrete, right? At zero, of course, you know, that's a non-discrete point in this whole set, but um, so of course we don't have the characteristic function as, of, at zero in this space, but we have the characteristic function at every other point in the spectrum, okay? And also we see some nice little properties of what del one is doing, okay? Uh, in particular, it's sort of just like a uh, twisted slope, right? 
the Lipschitz seminorm is like gives you the exact slope, but this is sort of giving you like just a twisted slope with with some scaling by this element from SUQ two. Okay, in particular, this you know you can you know if you're <laughs> if you're bored, you can show that on these elements uh, you can actually show that this is not the Lipschitz seminorm. So we truly have to use um, a new technique here, in particular the technique of finding some sort of integral for del one. Okay. All right, so we were able to do this uh, on the, well, eventually we'll do it on the whole um, uh, compact op on the whole SQ2, on the whole the domain in SQ2. But uh, we're able to first tackle it. This is how we first tackled the problem. We, we uh, looked at the, uh, just the diagonal. So we're able to define an integral. Remember del one, why we're doing this sort of with a B star, A star. Remember, we really only care about the integral of elements that after you take the derivative and notice back here once you take the derivative you spit out this b star a star okay um so we really care about that and we're able to integrate things like that okay and this is acting like some sort of like twisted integral on the, the points um and then here you get also the evaluation that zero is zero so things are looking nice and it's a bounded operator too okay it doesn't have as nice bound as the uh as a Volterra operator, which had norm bound one, but it's still for fixed Q, that's good enough. Um, that does the job. And how does it do the job? Well, first, the idea and, and, and a strategy we'll use later on when we get to the all of SQ2 is that we look at elements against um, these projections, okay, against these, these characteristic functions. It sort of simplifies the problem a lot. And in, in fact, we were first able to show that our integral whatever it is, well, I did define on the previous slide, um, does get rid of the del one in this case, right? As long as you're against um, these characteristic functions, okay? And furthermore, you can then, um, and just to remind us our goal, we're trying to show this set is totally bounded, okay? Um, we're able to, overall, for any element in the domain of the seminorm and in the diagonal still, Okay, we're able to show that the integral of the derivative is the func original function minus this constant, okay? So if both f of zero is zero and norm del f is actually equal to one, you can actually get this quantity here for all your functions in that set, okay? Why is that good? Well, not only does it show us that all our functions are bounded, um, we're also gonna get equicontinuity because equicontinuity doesn't come for free anymore because we're not just a Lipschitz seminorm. So we have to tackle two things, right? We still have to show this as bounded and equicontinuous uh, before the Lipschitz seminorm gave us equicontinuity for free. And then we're able to use that technique I showed to just get boundedness. Here we have to do both equicontinuity and boundedness. This does do both of those as well. We get boundedness of all our elements and equicontinuity at the only place that matters, right? At zero, right? So as, notice as k goes to infinity, that's where this is going to zero. We're essentially just saying that all the functions in this set vanish at zero just as fast, right? The rate at which they vanish at zero is the same. So you do get equicontinuity at zero, which is the only place that matters. Um, I mean, you can, and then you get equicontinuity everywhere. Um, but the only place you really had to check was at zero, and this is what that's doing. So, our integral, so, so we were successful in generalizing this approach of the classical case using Lipschitz seminorm and the classical derivation uh, on the closed interval from zero to one. Okay, so what comes next? Well, <clears throat> we wanna do this for SQ2, okay? We wanted to find an integral for the derivation on all of the compact operators, not just a diagonal. But the strategy, we're gonna use the same strategy, okay? All right, we want a, some bounded operator that cancels the derivative up to a scalar. In fact, this is going to be the state that projects onto the unit of the unitization of the compact operators. Um, and also, we want this sort of equicontinuity thing happening. So one way to rephrase, it's kind of hard to see this, is we want just things close to zero to, to be able to control things close to zero, right? Um, and also, we're not the compact operators aren't just continuous functions on some on the spectrum of A, we still kind of want to do the same philosophy. We want to be able to control things that are close to zero, okay? And we're going to be able to do that still with the elements from the spectrum, continuous functions on the spectrum of A, 
um, against elements from the polar sphere overall, not just elements from the diagonal. So that's happened to be really nice. And this will provide boundedness and quantum equicontinuity. I guess I mean, we didn't really use that term in the paper, but um, the idea was there, the same idea of we're gonna have some sort of quantum equicontinuity. Of course, we can't use, we're not gonna be able to use our ZLS goal anymore, um, but uh, hopefully this strategy works and it will, and as I'll present uh, now, <laughs> soon. Um, okay, so the idea here is again, we, saw, we want to still use the, these characteristic functions. I mean, that's here, that's gonna simplify things. Right, so we still want to sort of view SQ2 as sort of like, you know, just, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, span of these characteristic functions, even though that's impossible, but we still want to use those, okay? And, and the key is kind of in here, in the sense that, you know, what if we take just random, you know, all functions from SQ2 and hit them with the characteristic functions, right? We're going to get a bunch of subspaces and maybe just simplifying things by looking at each of those subspaces may do the job. Okay, so this is the next idea we used, okay, was sort of we really want to try to use the strategy we had before. Um, now we have much more, than, right? So basically you can think of, so I'm, I guess I'm highlighting here, you can think of what we just did was, you know, when uh, SQ2 was one, right? Meaning we just had the identity element, okay? Now what if we have all of SQ2, okay, all right? What we did before, just a couple slides ago, in the diagonal case, we just had one here. Uh, now, what if we have all of SQ2? Can we still do similar strategies? Okay. Well, something amazing happened <laughs> when we did this. Okay, and I like to highlight this. One of these. This is one of the results I like to highlight specifically. When you look at these subspaces, so YK kind of build up for all K. They kind of build up to SQ2. Not really. I mean, it's not, there's no formality there, but build up enough in the sense to give us estimates overall. Okay, but how were we able to successfully do that? Well, these YK spaces, it turned out that the C star norm on these subspaces is a Hilbert norm. Like, I think without this realization, I don't think we would have gotten that eventually that we have a spectral metric space. Okay, was that the C, again, these are subspaces, not subalgebras. <laughs> uh, they're not C star subalgebras, they're subspaces. We're able to show that the C star norm on these is a Hilbert norm. And that's amazing because then you can use things like parcels identity and you know Pythagorean theorem, and that gives you incredible ways to control estimates, right? Because you can control them not just on the right but on the left as well using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, so, but how do we do this? How do we how do we recover it as an inner product norm? Um, yeah. Uh, so. Um, uh, how do you recover an inner product norm on this? Um, well, it's not too bad in the sense that it uses some very natural standard structure of the photosphere, okay? They use uh, the circle action, okay? All right, um, and then what you do is you take the conditional excitation onto the continuous functions on the, to the diagonal, okay? You project them to the diagonal using this conditional excitation given by a circle action. Of course, this is a standard trick to do with circle actions. And then from there, you get a state on SQ2 by composing, right now you're on just a continuous function space, which has these point masses, and you compose with that, and you get a state, the inner product induced by that state um, is in fact the C star norm, again. I, I feel like I'm uh, repeating this too much, but this was like probably the biggest deal here, the, 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 that was able to get us our results, okay? All right, so that was amazing for us. That helped us out a lot. Um, and it's only going to help us out, you know, combine things further. As I said, this is the strategy that we want. We want to sort of just fiber over the spectrum of A, essentially. Um, however, we needed to get things a little more explicit in sense of compact operators, right? We're really trying to, we're using this philosophy and not just philosophy that the SQ2 is a compact operators. Um, we're not, this, this proposition isn't claiming we were the first one to show, right, that SQ2 was a compact operator. So it was done. Uh, a long time ago, uh, but we are just saying that we found matrix units. I don't know, maybe somebody else knows a reference, but we we we, we were never able to find matrix units, so we did develop our own matrix units for um, 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 SQ2 for, for and in particular for each K and N. If you um, go you you um, 
go through n equals zero to infinity, you do get your elements in these yk spaces. So it was a particular uh, form of the matrix unit that was very useful for us. Um, and with that explicit presentation, using the matrix units, um, we got um, that uh, on these yk spaces, we got this set was totally bounded. Okay, so that, that was a very big hint that we're on our way. Remember, we wanted to have this, these are just on each yk space. Remember, the whole polar sphere is like you know, the sum of these yk spaces. Again, that's very informal because something happens <laughs> at zero, that's not very nice. Um, but uh, the idea is that this is a very, and notice we don't have to worry about vanishing under a state here because for instance, uh, these elements aren't in the unit. They don't hit the units of the unitization of the compacts. So we really aren't, we don't have to worry about scaling multiples of identity here. Okay, so um, it's enough to show that this set is totally bounded, um, which is in fact bigger than the other set anyway. But, uh, but I just want to make it clear why it's, right? The goal had this other, you know, and, zero under some state, but we don't need that for these because they, they don't have units anyway. It doesn't have a unit anyway. Um, it doesn't have the units from the unitization of the compacts. Okay, so together with this and this, um, um, right, our goal now to remind us, our goal now is to do that such a thing for all elements in the domain of the uh, semi-norm here. And, uh, and then vanishing under the state. And again, we're gonna use this phi sub infinity, which is just projection onto um, this, the units of the unitization of the compacts, or in particular, this is just the unique tracial state uh, on the compact operators. There's only one, um, it's not faithful, of course, but it's, there's a unique tracial state. Um, so that's, what, that's the set we wanna show is totally bounded, okay? We have that if we just look at each yk, that it's you know, kind of already totally bounded, but how do we now combine that all together, okay? Well, the idea is again, we want it, we have such a set, we wanna assume elements, the norm of the derivation is that's equal to one, but we wanna get rid of the derivation, right? As we saw before. And how do you get rid of the derivation in the classical case and also on our work on the diagonal, it was to come up with an integral, something that got rid of the derivation, okay? So the idea then is to use the matrix units that we found and take elements, okay and just see take their the derivation of them and see how to cancel the derivation um so the rest of the slide you're not going to get much from it to be honest I, we just want to show you how we did it it didn't come from the sky we just <laughs> we just had to do a lot of calculations um so the idea is that we took an element x uh, applied the derivation to it and then hit hit the element with these uh, characteristic functions okay uh, and then we saw how to undo that Okay, so just to show you, this is the type of calculation you dealt with. Again, I, I don't expect anybody to get anything from this equation, this quantity amount, just to tell you that, um, you know, this is our approach. Just calculate, just, you know, straightforward, calculate these things, and then find some sort of operator that you, you hit this with, and you're left with just x times uh, the characteristic function. So, so this was just, you know, we had to do a bunch of calculations like these, and then we had to just undo what was happening here. Okay, so working through all those calculations. So, so again, it wasn't some sort of like, oh, there's this operator that exists, and um, it was it was calculation based, um, which I think is fine. I'm just <laughs> I'm just making it clear uh, the approach we took. Um, and then uh, and then notice here, this kind of tells us also what kind of elements we're looking for to define the quantum interval, because remember, it's gonna be defined on some sort of different domain. Technically, it's gonna to have to even exist on SUQ2, the quantum SU2, the bigger space, because the derivation spits out elements there. So we define the space uh, for our quantum, the domain of the quantum integral to be this. So we found it to be this. So it's elements in the bounded operators with respect to the representation of the polar sphere, of the, sorry, SUQ2. Um, and then, uh, elements that end up in y sub k times b star squared, which is motivated by the equation on the previous slide. Um, and then sort of, <laughs> again, I, you know, I don't wanna go through more of the calculations, um, but the idea is we, we, we did it, <laughs> right? We accomplished a task um, that we found a bound linear operator such that if you get rid of, that it gets rid of the derivation up to this state that projects onto the units of the unitization of the compacts. 
okay? And we get this quantum echo continuity, meaning close to zero, if we integrate something, we can control its norm, okay? And in fact, remember, we're, we're, for the psi element, we're plugging in, we're gonna eventually plug in delta, del one of x, okay? So therefore, you're just getting uh, norm of del one of x here, which is less than or equal to one, if you're in that set that we want. And so you really are, and then, then you get just norm of x, everything works out. So you really are controlling back the norm of x uh, next to zero, okay? Because again, <laughs> it's, you know, compacts, they're more than just a diagonal, but the idea is that we were able to just, you know, uh, use the same philosophy um, that was used there. Okay, so again, this gave us quantum echo continuity, well, quantum echo continuity and boundedness as well of that set. Um, and we're able to, so we don't have some sort of general proof, like if you have quantum, like we didn't define formally quantum echo continuity, it's just, we're able to just, and again, we couldn't use like a non, I think there are non-commutative Arzelia Scoli theorems, but that's not what we did. We just, we just were able to show the set was totally bounded. We were able to show that for all epsilon, you know, there's uh, finally many balls of size epsilon that cover uh, the desired set. Um, so I'm just using quantum echo continuity informally. Okay, and yeah, so this did the job for us. Um, I got that the set is totally bounded. In fact, um, once you prove to one is redundant, because here you're essentially showing you it's showing that if you quotient by the scalars, um, that set's going to be uh, that set has to be bounded. Um, so you couldn't have you couldn't vanish on more than the scalars. If you did, then you could have a real you'd have a whole real line sitting uh, inside this inside the at once you quotient by the scalars, you'd have an entire real line sitting in that set in the ball of the lip in the ball of the lip norm, and so you couldn't be a bounded set. Um, but we still highlight both. We did actually prove both separately, <laughs> even though we realized that two is enough to prove one. Um, anyway, but yeah, we were able to do it. Um, this is a Leibniz compact quantum metric space, and therefore it's a compact spectral metric space in the sense of um, uh, Bellasar, Macaulay, and Rayon. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> this so this is nice, but in some sense, let's remind us of the whole story, right? The whole story I mentioned on the, on the first slide, right? The goal of it is to take, all right, we eventually want to show that the polar spheres converge to the sphere, right? Sort of mirroring Riefel's fuzzy spheres. Of course, the fuzzy spheres are finite dimensional. These polar spheres are compact operators. They're, they're the compact operators on an infinite, infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So they're infinite dimensional, but so you know, philosophy of, you know, deformations, maybe can we show that certain deformations converge? Right. So we do eventually want to show polar sphere converge to the sphere. Um, this talk and this paper, so it is on the archive, I'll put the archive number, It'll, you'll see it on the references. Um, you'll see that, so yeah, so we have that this is a quantum metric space, right? Now next is to show convergence, right? So here you, here we have the, you know, future work. If you have a sequence of elements in zero one that converge to one, um, then show that limit as n goes infinity, though this converges to the two sphere, uh, where ds2 is the round metric on the two sphere, and disk q is Riefel's quantum gram of or distance. You could also, I mean, lots from Rieder's propinquity is also, um, it depends on what kind of spaces you're using, but it's a little more difficult to, to get lots from Rieder's propinquity. So a first thing you can tackle is Riefel's this Q. And then if things, if you are able to capture enough multiplicative structure, then you use lots from Rieder's propinquity, which actually shows that sort of the algebras are converging, not, not just the um, uh, sort of the ordered unit spaces of the self adjoint elements. Um, so this is the first goal um, uh, to use Riefel's quantum distance. Uh, now, um, there is some nice work already in this direction uh, due to uh, Gofferson, Kaut, uh, Jens Kaut, and David Kayed, um, where they show the diagonals converge to the uh, continuous function on the spectrum of A in the two sphere. Okay, so the diagonals converge to the diagonal. I mean, this is literally a diagonal, as you saw. And here I'm using A sub Q now. Uh, I guess I meant to put A sub Q N. But here we have diagonals. Diagonals converge to the diagonal of the two sphere, right? Which is continuous functions on the spectrum of A. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's already a very nice sign that we do get 
the diagonal sky. And remember, this was our philosophy to even show we had a quantum metric space, right? Was to show that um, first things work on the diagonal and then extend that to the compact operators, which is our approach in this talk. So it's nice that they have this result because it suggests that, okay, once we get diagonals then maybe, um, you know, we can approach the next step as well. Um, and this is this, this, this convergence with respect to disk Q and La Tremere's propinquity. Um, since it also, it was established actually using the classical Gram of Hauser distance. Remember, these are continuous functions on there. So they, what was nice, their method was they were able to realize the Lip norm as a Lipschitz semi-norm of a different metric than the one on R. So was, they had to develop a new metric uh, using the Montekrovich metric back on the spectrum of A. Um, and then they were able to realize that by a certain Lipschitz seminar, not the one on R that I mentioned previously, but from, from the usual absolute value metric, but a different uh, seminar. So yeah, so this is future work. Um, and a good, this is paper already by uh, Godfrey Kad and Kayed uh, on the archive. So, so yeah, here are the papers. This is the one where this talk was, this is the talk. <laughs> Um, and the paper of Belisar, McCall, and Riani, uh, Dabrowski's guitars. Oh, yeah, and yes, and this is the paper I just mentioned by, um, about showing the diagonals converge uh, to the diagonal of the two sphere and published. And the first paper that uh, Riffle discussed quantum metric spaces. Um, so, yeah, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, do we have any questions? Um, you'll, you can just unmute yourself and ask if you like. Um, alternatively, you can type it into the chat. So I have some questions, if we can go first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you for a very nice talk. Um, so the first question I ask, uh, when you're looking at the spectral triples, the difficult condition there is always the compact resolvent. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult to calculate. Do you actually use the fact that it's got compact resolvent? <clears throat> no, so that's that's surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah you don't. Um, so the, that and that's this is, um, I would say, a, a very nice open question in the yeah. area of non commutative metric geometry is what conditions um, do you have to tack on to the definition of spectral triple uh, to get um, a uh, quantum metric space, you know, using that seminorm. So nobody, yeah, nobody knows yet. Um, and there, I think the, the, I'm pretty sure there are examples where you don't need, um, uh, you don't really need compact resolvent. Um, okay. and, and also there are examples where you have compact resolvent and they may not be a quantum metric space. So, um, so then yeah. yes, my um, naive or very hopeful idea would be perhaps if one can show that something is that a Dirac operator that you have where you have everything except the compact resolving condition. Then if you showed that this was a compact quantum metric space that somehow by convergence you could show that it had to have by some continuity that you had, you could then conclude that it did have compact resolving from the classical compact resolving. Um, okay, okay, so you're saying that... Um, okay, so... So, you, so the original space, you don't know whether it doesn't or you don't know whether it has compact. I guess you, you suspect that it does, but it's very difficult to calculate. So perhaps instead of trying to show it as compact resolvent, mm -hmm. show that it gives a compact quantum metric space, then use gram of Hausdorff continuity to show that because it does classically, and then solve this compact resolvent condition using compact quantum. Oh, that's... that's um... I, I haven't, I haven't, no, I haven't kind of countered that, but I think that would be very, very speculative. Yeah, I don't know, no. I mean, that's definitely an interesting question. That's uh, something interesting to look into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would, that would be, that would be great too, because it would show. That would be great. Yeah. Metric geometry and non-commutative geometry and that thing. Yeah. Non-commutative yeah. geometry. Good, good question. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I don't think there's an answer, and it's definitely, I think. Worth um, looking into. Then a second question I would ask. So you're using the the diagonal that you have. Yeah. Well, first of all. The, Butlish, there is a very special example of a quantum like manifold. Okay, yeah. So the natural question is, I mean, it's so specifically, it's S2 is the same as CP1. Yeah. Quantum effective line, so you have quantum, quantum CPN. So the question is, what you're doing, does that extend up to quantum CPN? 
So from what I understood, the, I mean, the first, the place where you start is the diagonal. I mean, that exists for CPN as well. Okay, okay. So one of the spheric, spherical functions or something like this. So I mean, if, if one were able to show that, so a, a place to start for these, for quantum projective space would be first to show that we had a, that the spectral triple which exists on these spaces, the direct generalization of the Dombrowski sitarch that this gives a compact quantumetric space on the diagonal for higher CPN. Yeah, 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 no, no, that, that's, no, I haven't looked into these things, but yeah, no, I, I would, yeah, the, the, I think this strategy would be a yeah, nice place to start for that, yeah, to, uh, I mean, I have to look, I, I've not studied quantum CPNs. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, but I mean, it's, honestly, the generalization is not that different. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I, we really like this, uh, it was a lot of fun doing this quantum integral business, and I, I think, I think, like, we do think that that, should see um, applications elsewhere. So this may be another uh, way to sort of, you know, uh, undoing the derivation given by commu uh, given by commutators of the Dirac operator. Um, I, I feel like trying to come up with an in you know an operator that cancels that. I think is um, like we'd be very excited to see more applications of that sort of idea. And yeah, quantum CPN prime. Yeah. That sounds like it'd be a good place to start for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions in the audience? Feel free to unmute and ask. I saw someone unmute. Maybe they have a question. No, oh, maybe not. All right. Well, in that case, I guess we'll just uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Somehow the clapping on uh, Zoom is always kind of depressing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can see, I can see some of the, uh, the claps on the. Uh... You can do the reactions, yeah. Like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah just, uh... All right. So next week our speaker is Laura Ismert, uh, who has not given me a title yet, but uh, I'm sure she will give us a very nice talk. So I hope to see you guys there virtually again. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you.